Sincere appreciation, overflowing affirmation, trust and love, that marks the true body of Christ. The Bible offers timeless truths as designed by the Creator Himself. Some of those truths get down to the everyday life of the church. Paul's letter to Philemon contains many of those, as you'll see again today on The Truth Pulpit. Hi, I'm Bill Wright, and Pastor Don Green is going to move us further into our current series, Philemon, Charge That to My Account. Don, what's in store for us over the next couple of days? Well, my friend, one of the greatest privileges of being a Christian is to be able to make a positive impact on the lives of other Christians that you fellowship with in your local church. These lessons that are just ahead on the Truth Pulpit are going to help you do that. Life is hard. It's easy to get discouraged. And Scripture shows us the way to make a difference in ways that are easy to understand and to put into practice. You'll be a more effective Christian as a result of hearing God's Word today on the Truth Pulpit. Friend, turn in your Bible to Philemon 2 as we join Pastor Don Green now in the Truth Pulpit. I would encourage you to turn to the text that we're studying this month. The book of Philemon, the short letter that Paul wrote to a man named Philemon some 2,000 years ago, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and writing to deal with a particular situation that had occurred at that time that we introduced last week, and yet being mindful that, it, that, that embedded in this letter are principles that are of timeless value, that have, have abiding significance for us as Christians in the way that we see our relationships and how we interact with one another. Last time you could say that we introduced the people that are in the book of Philemon. We looked at the Apostle Paul and the fact that he was in prison. We considered Philemon, who was a a man of some means, who was a noble Christian man and was a person that was central in the functioning of the church that met at his house. And we also introduced Onesimus, who was a, a fugitive slave who had once belonged to Philemon but had run away and now somehow had met the Apostle Paul in Rome and had been converted to Christ and Paul sends him back because he had things that he needed to make he needed to make right with his master Philemon. And so we saw the people in the letter as we met together last time and we drew a parallel that I trust is still kind of ringing in your mind that Paul was acting as an intercessor for Onesimus. He was interceding with Philemon. Onesimus had wronged Philemon. He had probably stolen from him and had broken the relationship and had had wronged him and thieved from him. And Philemon, as the master of the slave, had a right to punish him for that misconduct. Paul, taking the role of an intercessor, gives this letter and sends Onesimus back to Philemon. And behalf of Onesimus, asks Philemon to receive him favorably and says, if, if Onesimus has wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. I'll pay the debt. Just receive him back and forgive him so that you can be united together once more. And Paul makes that basis of the plea. We said that there is a picture there of what the Lord Jesus Christ did before for us, I should say, what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us before a holy God. We were the one who had violated and wronged God the Father. We had broken His law. We had, we had sinned against Him. We were unfit for His presence. Worse than that, we were subject and liable to His just punishment. We had nothing that we could say on behalf of ourselves. We had no righteousness of our own with which to approach God. And what did our Lord Jesus do except to come to earth and to live a life that met all of the demands of God's law? And then He offered that perfect life up on a cross as the payment for our sins. Well, this week... Today, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to move on and, and kind of go do a, a quick survey of the opening section of Philemon's letter. Now that we've got the people out and introduced, I want to show you from the way that Paul addresses Philemon the, the, the principles 
the spiritual principles that underlie this letter. And then in a, the following week or two, we'll look at exactly everything that Paul says to him. But Paul addresses Philemon out of the overflow of certain spiritual characteristics, certain spiritual attitudes, certain spiritual principles that inform everything that he says in this letter. And it all just kind of spills naturally out as he addresses Philemon in this opening section of the letter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 here this morning, and I encourage you to follow along with me as we read. Philemon verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphthia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. What I want to do this morning is kind of go through this passage really without the outline that I normally would give to you, but just to kind of walk through this section of Scripture and then at the end draw out a few simple pieces of application that would help inform and to uh, shape our life together as a body of Christ here in this local church and just kind of walk through the letter without some artificial structure being put on it and realizing that Philemon would have received this letter and he just would have read this, these words from the hand of his friend, from the apostle, from his fellow Christian, Paul. And so that's what we're going to do here this morning. Notice how Paul opens the letter in the, in the custom of letter writing in that day. He identifies himself first. We do it just the opposite. We, we say who's writing the letter at the very end. And the first century, they did it just opposite, which I think actually makes a little bit more sense. Who is this letter from? Oh, it's from Paul. I see it right off, rather than having to read all the way to the end to find out the answer to it. And Paul's opening here is, is a little bit different than what you'll find if you compare it with other letters that he wrote. In, in many of his letters, he'll start out by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And he, he does that in the other letters to emphasize his authority as he writes. That as he writes to a local church, he is doing so as an authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus Christ whose word must be obeyed, whose word must be followed, because he is giving the Lord's instruction to his church. And because Jesus Christ is Lord, we are under a responsibility to do what he says to do, to obey, because the church belongs to Christ. It is his by divine purchase. And so Paul often writes and opens up his letters appealing to his apostleship as the ground upon which he writes. You know what? He doesn't do that here. And the difference is striking and gives you a sense that he is doing something different when he writes this letter. Notice what he says there in the opening verse, Philemon verse 1. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Notice this, beloved. He calls himself a prisoner which in one sense is identifying his present circumstances. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus, by which he means that I am imprisoned by the will and direction of my sovereign master. I am here suffering. I have lost my liberty out of my faithfulness to the ministry that Christ has given to me. And so Paul is sitting in prison, writing this letter, and yet he writes not as an apostle, saying, I have authority to write here, but he says, he describes himself, his self-description is, I'm writing to you as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Why does he do that? Why does he make that kind of distinction? Why not? He has something that he wants Philemon to do. Watch this. This is really important. He has something that he wants Philemon to do. He has a, a message that Philemon is to give heed to, but he doesn't appeal to authority as he does it. He is not writing as one commanding. 
He is writing as one who is making an appeal. Look at verse 10 there where you can see this. Actually, in verse 9 as well, let's just for fun go to verse 8. Kind of working my way backwards there. I want you to see that how Paul describes himself as verse 1 is consistent with the appeal that he makes later in the letter. In verse 8, he says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, he says, I, I'm confident of my authority as an apostle. I could tell you what to do. But he says, that's not what I'm doing here. He says, rather, for love's sake, I am appealing to you. I, I am treating you. I am speaking to you in deference. I'm speaking to you as an equal. I am asking for you for something, not commanding you. It changes the whole nature of the appeal. And he goes on in verse 10, and he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. So you see the difference? You see the tone? Sometimes it's very important to notice these very basic fundamental facts so that you understand the entire spirit in which a letter is being written. This is not an apostle commanding someone to do something. This is a Christian who is suffering, saying, I'm asking you to do something. And you know distinctly, you know intuitively, you know by your own experience the difference that you feel when someone comes and insists that you do something and says, you must do what I say, versus someone who says, I'm appealing to who you are and I'm asking you to do something. The spirit of this letter is a request not a command based on apostolic authority. And so here what you see is, and what makes this letter a particularly sweet part of Scripture, is you see Paul writing a personal letter to a man that he considers a fellow worker and a friend and says, I'm appealing to you like that. In the context of the body of Christ, I'm writing to you to appeal in love to you. And so picture yourself as Philemon receiving this letter. First of all, it's from Paul. You've got an established relationship with him in the past. And Paul, and Paul says, I'm, I'm writing to you from prison. Immediately, your sympathy is going to be out toward him. He is suffering for the sake of the gospel that, that saved my soul. He's suffering for Christ. He's suffering for my Christ. He's lost his liberty, and he's writing to me from prison. Your heart is going to be open and drawn to what he has to say to you, just out of a matter of pure human sympathy, out of sympathy for the gospel. And so immediately, from the way that Paul frames it, there's this sense of warmth that is created in what is said. Let's go on. Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. It's simply indicating that Timothy is with Paul as he wrote this letter. Timothy knew Philemon from prior experience, from prior relationships. They had been together. And so Paul is simply acknowledging that Timothy is with him. Note this, Timothy is not a co-author of the letter. Because as you go into the body of the letter, Paul writes in the first person singular, I appeal to you. I ask you to do this. Philemon is my child, not our, not we. And so the mention of Timothy is simply incidental, a courtesy to the fact that Timothy is with him, a recognition that Philemon and Timothy knew each other, but it's simply an opening courtesy, not an indication that Timothy was joint author with Paul in the letter. Timothy Timothy was not an apostle, and so he would not be writing in that capacity. He, would, he is not on an equal plane with Paul in terms of the basis upon which this appeal is made. But he knows Philemon, and so just as a natural matter, of course, Paul says, Timothy joins in the greeting that I'm sending to you. Now, with that said, look at how he addresses Philemon there at the end of verse 1. To Philemon, our beloved brother and our fellow worker. This is a private letter to Philemon. And he, he's addressing Philemon from a, from a posture, a, a, a position of appreciation and affirmation. That's really essential to see. Paul here says, Philemon, I recognize you as a fellow brother in Christ. 
I recognize, Philemon, that we have worked together on Christ in the past. We have a standing relationship, one of love, one of shared ministry. And so again, you see the way that he is addressing him is he is addressing him on a, on a horizontal plane of equality, saying, Philemon, my brother, I write to you. Philemon, my fellow worker, I write to you. Philemon, I'm writing to you as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And so what I want you to see is, and this is all going to inform our life in the body going forward, what I want you to see is, is that the, the skillful sympathy that Paul cultivates from the very start, he shows respect, he shows deference, he declares his love, he declares his own personal circumstances. There is a whole lot of human warmth and relational uh, attributes going on as we see this letter being opened up before us. As we read this, this is a letter between two friends. This is a letter from two fellow Christians, not from, between two fellow Christians that have shared life together. And now an issue has come up that needs to be addressed, and Paul appeals to the context of their relationship before he moves into what he wants Philemon to do. Here's the thing. As Philemon is reading this, and again, just picture yourself receiving a letter like this from perhaps a spiritual leader of, that you've respected and worked with in years gone by, and he addresses you with that kind of love and warmth and respect. You're going to be inclined toward him. You're going to be receptive to what he has to say. All of that contained just in that simple first verse. Now, as the letter goes on, notice what Paul says here in verse 2. Paul not only have it, has acknowledged that Timothy is with him, he makes an incidental acknowledgement of the people that are with Philemon. Look at verse 2 with me. He says, And to Apthia, our sister, she was perhaps, perhaps even likely, Philemon's wife, given the order in which she is addressed here. She's a fellow Christian and likely Philemon's wife. And then he goes on and says, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, some people think that maybe he was Philemon's son. Others think that maybe he was a leader in the church as well and that he's writing to Philemon, but he's appealing also and recognizing that there is a, there is a pastoral leader in the midst as well that he should give recognition to. Whatever the case may be, he's simply acknowledging that other people are going to see this letter, and he greets them as a courtesy as he writes this private letter to Philemon. And then notice at the end of verse 2, he says, "...and to the church that is in your house." We talked about this last time. The, the believers in that city met in Philemon's house. He gave them the facility, the structure in which they were able to meet together and and to honor the Lord and to worship the Lord and to meet for instruction. And so there's a group of people around Philemon that Paul incidentally mentions in passing, but then he moves on into a private address that he wants to make. Now I want to say something here to help kind of give you a sense of what I believe the right way to understand the letter is. There are those, and there are some good commentators who say, when you see verse 2, what Philemon is doing is, is that, that he, is, he is invoking those other people, the church and Archippus and Apphia, he invokes these other people as a means of imposing accountability on Philemon to answer in, in the way that he responds to the letter. So the idea is, is that Paul has something that he wants Philemon to do, and he mentions these other people up front as a way of saying, Philemon, there are other people who are going to watch how you respond to this, and they are going to hold you accountable. The expectation is, is that the public accountability will help Philemon do the right thing in case he didn't want to do it on his own. What should we say about that? I think it's kind of an important point. I think that's unlikely. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's a proper way of understanding what Paul is doing. And, and the distinction is, is important for understanding the spirit of the letter. Paul has said, as we've already seen in what I've said this morning, 
especially there in verses 8 through 10. Paul has made it clear, I am not compelling you. I am not commanding you. I am not asserting my apostolic authority in what I say here. Philemon, we're brothers. I don't need to. I don't need to bear the rod to you. We're brothers. I can talk to you out of a sense of love, and you'll, I know what you'll do. I know that you'll respond well. Look at verse 21 of Philemon. He says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. What's he saying? He says, Philemon, I have confidence that you're going to do the right thing, and I appeal to you as I'm writing to you. This is, may seem incidental, but I think it's important. If, if Paul was going to use these people surrounding Philemon to be an element of compulsion for Philemon to do what he asked to do, it undermines the whole spirit of the letter. If he is going to use those people to pressure Philemon into doing what Paul asks, it makes the whole rest of his letter dishonest. As he's expressing confidence and trust and saying, Philemon, I know you'll do the right thing, so I just need to appeal to you in love. If, while he's saying that, he's saying, and you other guys over here, make sure he does it. It conveys the entirely wrong sense of the spirit of the letter. And so I think it's better to simply say Paul knew that other people were going to be there as this letter was received. He acknowledges them, he greets them, but he moves on and talks to Philemon man to man. Look, Paul didn't need Apphia. He wasn't hiding behind the skirts of Apphia to get Philemon to do what he wanted. He's talking to Philemon man to man. He's talking to him brother to brother. And you know that because as you go through the rest of the letters, you go through the body of the letter, Paul says, I, first person singular, talk to you, Philemon, second person singular. That's very clear in the original language. This is one man to another man. And so the mention of these people here in verse 2 is merely incidental and a courtesy, not the enforcement mechanism of Paul's letter. If Paul wanted to enforce obedience, he could have done so with his own apostolic authority. And so I mention that simply to, to clarify and to help us see that the spirit of this letter is one of love and trust. And love and trust, the ability to trust one another, is essential to unity in the church. It is imperative that there be trust in the church, that we know that we can be, have confidence in how one another is addressing us. Well, if Paul was using these other people to manipulate Philemon, then the whole pretext of the letter is lost. And so we set that aside and just say, Paul, and we follow as Paul deals with his brother in love. Look at verse 3. He closes his introduction with this traditional greeting that is found often in his letters. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace brings peace. God's grace, the grace of Christ, brings peace in two different senses to us as a believer. In a judicial sense, it brings us an objective peace with God in the sense that our sins are forgiven and we do not fear the judicial punishment of God. Why? Because that judicial punishment was fulfilled at the cross. God has punished Christ for our sins. Now He looks at us as believers and says, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. That is a gracious act of God toward us, and it means that there is peace with God between us, between you and God if your faith is in Christ. God brings peace. There is no longer war. There is no longer wrath coming from God toward you as a Christian. Why? because it's all been settled. There's no reason for anger. There's no reason for judgment any longer because it was fully discharged and dispensed with when Christ drank the cup to the last drop on our behalf. And so there's no reason for you to fear the judgment of God as a Christian. Why? Because peace has been brought through the grace of God. You are declared righteous in the presence of a holy God. We'll have to pause right there for today. 
But Pastor Don Green will continue this lesson on being an encourager next time. It's the latest installment of our series, Philemon. Charge that to my account. So plan now to join us here on the Truth Pulpit. But right now, Don's back here in studio with some closing words. You know, friend, I listen to a lot of Christian radio myself, and I know how the game is played at this stage of the program. People have something to sell to you, or they make a strong ask for your support. Well, that's not what I want to do today at all. I just want you to know that our perspective on this ministry is this. The Truth Pulpit exists for you, to minister God's Word to you. You do not exist in order to make this ministry possible. We trust the Lord for his provision, and he's been very generous to us. So please know that we love you, that we want you to benefit from our program, and that we have no expectations of what you're going to do in response. We just want you to hear God's word, receive it, understand it, and obey it. And we trust that God will bless you and us as that process takes place. Thanks, Don. And friend, remember, you have a standing invitation to visit thetruthpulpit.com to find out more about this ministry. That's thetruthpulpit.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Bill Wright, and we'll see you next time for more from The Truth Pulpit.